Hello, everybody, and welcome to a conversation with artist Ken Avick. Hello, Ken. Hi, hi, Lisa. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for exhibiting in the seventh annual Evanston May Group Show virtual gallery. That was a big leap of faith for many of us, so we appreciate you joining in the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Can you first describe uh, the piece that you're exhibiting? Yes. Um, the piece that I'm exhibiting is part of um, a number of pieces, so a series that I've been doing over a number of years. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Remnants 5, and it's a shape piece, which means that the shape of the canvas is cut out, so it's kind of a slightly modified T-shape. Uh, collage, most of it is glued, small pieces of canvas on top. Uh, the imagery um, is related kind of on a personal level. Uh, I have a daughter with autism and um, for a number of years I tried to think of ways of expressing this world that I can't totally understand. And so um, I decided to create in this series um, kind of mystical landscapes uh, mountains, um, different kinds of colors, something that we wouldn't see in real life and yet suggest things you might see. Um, and often within them is a giant flower or flowers growing. Uh, I saw that as a way of saying this is a scary world that looks like it doesn't have the resources necessarily to support things growing and yet miraculously it does. <laughs> These flowers being so huge are both beautiful and a little scary because what the hell is a seven foot flower doing in this? And then I used um, images, mostly photographic that I painted over of my daughter within these worlds. Oh, that's the character in the painting. It's your daughter interacting with these worlds that you've created, okay. Yeah, um, in some of them she's more interactive and a lot of them she's just reflective. She's kind of sitting there or standing there observing. In this I reached a point kind of in the series where I felt I needed to move beyond this. And I started creating um, images that, which are included in this remnants uh, piece in which there's white images, kind of shapes coming in and out. So the whole landscape can't be viewed. Mm -hmm. uh, you can view those images, I think, as um, am I looking through some kind of cave or window or trees that that block me from seeing everything. But in these images, I can see enough to, to kind of tell what's going on, but it does make sure I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. How tall is this place? What happens above, on the sides, below? Um, and I thought this was a way, metaphorical way of saying, I can try to get into viewing her world, but I'm blocked. I can't totally know what it's like to be someone else. Mm -hmm. And because my daughter who actually loves art and does art. And we did have a show, a combined show a number of years ago um, at Space 900 that I'm a member of. Um, but um, I thought this, this is a way of saying, she can't explain, doesn't have the vocabulary to tell me what she thinks, what she's feeling. I have to guess it kind of through her expressions, her anger, her pain, her happiness. Um, and so, that kind of blocking, but not completely blocking, was my metaphor for saying, um, this is how far I can get, but no further. And it also created, I thought, a nice contrast between these two. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I call it remnant because it can also be viewed as, this is a piece of the whole. Um, right. Maybe it cut out, maybe ripped out, but it's not the entire piece because we can never know the entire piece. Yeah, and I, I also love how in that sort of mystery, she's, she's featured alone, but calm, and in these just such interesting places where you've put her in the work, I, I love it. And I also love that it's, she's sort of hyper-realistic, and then the rest of the work is so mysterious. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, I, I think I, I, way, way back when I started a series, seven, eight years ago maybe, I did, um, kind of paint surreal images of her. Um, and I used to do diptychs and triptychs, which is when I started doing these shape paintings. Um, I had fun with a kind of series in which when I did a triptych, the two end pieces would have cutouts on either side and the middle piece would be 
a regular rectangle. And so I created for myself a kind of challenge of, can I create these triptychs where I can switch the two ends mm -hmm. so that the hole becomes in the middle or the, the hole becomes on the outside, the, the negative um, space there. And so that, that kind of got started with that piece. And somewhere along the way, I found using her photographic image is partly my lack of ability to paint as realistically <laughs> her as I can. Creative problem solving, Ken. That's what you call it. <laughs> Don't disparage yourself. <laughs> uh, and also then, because I could paint on top of that and yeah. use the colors and things, and yet it gives me a basis to begin that process. And keeping her small in these paintings, so she's part of that world, but she doesn't jump right out at you in a lot of them. You have to kind of... Yeah, you have to discover her, yeah, in a yeah. lot of them. Okay, so um, what is on your canvas right now? What is it that you're working on? Well, it just so happens, and this is really a, a change after years of, of painting these imagery, we have a plan at uh, the Gallery Space 900, which who knows what the future will be. Mm -hmm. um, Patience. In October, one of our members uh, had heard about from a, a European artist um, that there's going to try to be doing worldwide art related to climate change, mm -hmm. the environment. And the gallery decided we should try and uh, be part of that. Nice. It could include people speaking and maybe um, music or acting and, and each of us creating some piece that relates to um, the issue of climate change. Uh, so I've been doing, and especially now that we've been housebound, um, lots of work, some small pieces on paper to kind of preliminary do work, and mm -hmm. then larger pieces that um, are using some of the same kind of imagery. I brought one piece down, maybe I can, I, I don't know if it'll fit within the, the framework, but let me just to show. I love it when artists go and get stuff. It's so great because everybody's home right now. And it's so fun to have people jump know. off the camera and then jump back on. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see any of this or not. So oh, great. Um, oh, wonderful. That's huge. But, um, it, it uses some of the same mm -hmm. kind of mountain-like form. In this case, they're almost like monuments or some kind of things that have been decimated. And then these white forms have really taken over. So I thought of them as kind of dualities. So it's two ways of expressing what's going on. Uh, the grayish white forms are kind of this uh, symbolic way of saying destruction that's moving in from all directions. And behind is kind of what may be left. Yeah. These oh, that's are the so so the, orange, um, the orange in the sky reminds me, like some of those photos from the fires in California every year, it, that reminds me of like the, the fires with, that looks like the sky's on fire. I love that. Yeah, and that's what I got, you know, in, in the other pictures I've been doing shades of blue in the sky. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, you know, we're really talking about burning symbolically, yeah. but real, actually, in California, yeah. uh, in Brazil, all over. Mm -hmm. um, God forbid, in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't know what the future will be. Some of them I've created uh, areas with water, dealing with the flooding mm -hmm. that involved. So that's been kind of nice because uh, it kind of forced me, and that's what's one of the nice things about being part of a group doing things. I wouldn't have necessarily moved there on my own. Mm -hmm. I'm not be thinking, how can I use some of these imagery, which I like, the shape, canvas, the, the the texture and some of these intrusions, but have it say something else. Um, so that's been exciting. And I've been doing that for the past two months. So, so um, that might be in a group show in October, depending on Space 900's reopening plan. So that's our plan. Okay. But, you know, who the hell knows? Um, <laughs> three of the artists from Space 900 are planning to do a group show. We mm -hmm. haven't talked about what would be involved with it, but it, at that show, I'm thinking I may show a number of them, and probably when we have the October show, because there's eight of us, uh -huh. um, it would be maybe one or two pieces, since mine are fairly large. Nice. Okay, so in during this um, shelter in, you've been very prolific and painting a ton. You're prepping for upcoming shows. Is there any difference that about your practice? Are you painting more, painting less, only painting at night? 
probably painting more, uh, a combination of um, I'm not going out to, to meet with friends, um, uh, not having coffee, uh, you know, with guys. Um, meetings I've had, like with the gallery or with other folks, have been a lot of Zoom meetings, which is a bit like this. A lot of Zoom. Very, um, new world in which you know we're getting used to. Uh, the other piece is um, that my daughter's, who's an adult, she's 34 now, um, lives in a group home in Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. and she would come home every weekend. And um, they decided once it became shelter in that we would have Zoom meetings, but they didn't want to have parents visiting there because who knew? Oh, that's so hard. So it's been hard. Um, yeah. We could have taken her home and kept her for two months or so, but to be alone in our house and we're not going out much there, there's teachers coming in, there's folks yeah. working with her, she has friends there. Yeah. Uh, the Zoom meetings are hard because she's not someone who can really hold a conversation. Mm -hmm. So the hope is visualizing, seeing her mother and me, mm -hmm. at least I get to see her. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. so, so the one other side of that is instead of spending a lot of the weekends doing things with her, I'm painting again. So now it's seven days a week. So I'm sure like a lot of people, mm -hmm. days of the week seem like, what's the difference between <laughs> Monday and Saturday? <laughs> um, I have to look up, is this Wednesday or, you know, um, because the days um, have a lot in common. The other thing is, of course, the future seems unknown. We talked about the gallery shows. Um, mm. Case 900 was having a number of people who plan to be renting the gallery. Yeah. You know, that that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a gallery, you know what that's like. We are doing the window piece in coordination. Right. Uh, Thank you for that. Thank you for joining in the fun. Yeah, there is so much unknown. I just, it's, there seems to be a theme through these conversations with artists that, um, most of you are taking full advantage of the lack of obligate social obligations that would eat away from your studio time and really just pouring into new bodies of work and or older bodies of work. Can you talk a little bit about um, how long you've been an artist when you started self-identifying your sort of art career background without sure. taking up too much time, Ken? These are limited conversations. Okay, I'll make it real quick. Uh, <laughs> I was one of those people who, um, I think my parents identified that I loved doing art when I was like three years old or so. I mean, they even saved these, you know, little drawings and things, you know, and I remember a few times, you know, using crayon to draw on the walls and being told, no, no, no. No, no. <laughs> um, so I, I was always interested in art uh, and always loved doing art. Uh, I went, uh, I got a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, you know, major, uh, you know, claim to fame is that Andy Warhol went there, even though he never graduated. Um, wow. Then I wound up in Chicago because I uh, went to the University of Chicago to get a master's in fine arts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never been to Chicago before, but uh, it was great. They offered me a really good scholarship. Um, and uh, my, my advisor, teacher, whatever, was Vera Clements, was oh, a wow. wonderful person to be wow. with. It's a really small, it's gotten larger, but when I went many a year ago, it was pretty small. Mm -hmm. uh, great people, Ruth Duckworth was the ceramics teacher. Wow. Um, so, um, but pretty tiny, um, not at all like most of the other artists I've met in Chicago who've been to the Art Institute, which is a real, you know, mm -hmm. big uh, piece. Uh, but it was in, but that was kind of my formal background. Then I was painting, doing some teaching, not a lot, um, at the Hyde Park Art Center when I lived in Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really having to work pretty much, I got a, just a regular job to pay the bills. Yeah. And then I was luckily able to retire oh, probably about 10, 11 years ago. And that's when things really changed. Um, and being able, I have to say, and you know, I appreciate artists who were like me when you're younger, you have to work, you know, you mm -hmm. have to do other things. Even if you're working in art, you're still not doing maybe your things. Being able to work all the time has made a huge difference in terms of, I think, um, 
the progress I've done and just the excitement. Uh, the other part that was nice for me, and it just so happened, this was back when um, you used to be able to look at paper. Uh, <laughs> the Evanson Review was actually a paper piece. Uh -huh. back, um, I think about seven years ago or so maybe. Um, and I saw uh, an ad about um, Art Encounters Critique Group for artists. Oh, fun. Um, and that's been really, really nice for me. It, it led to being part of the Space 900 Gallery that um, Joanna Pinsky is really the spearhead for mm -hmm. and who leads the uh, critique groups. But once a month, being able to get together with other artists, mm -hmm. to see their work, nothing else, I think, when you're not having shows, it can be easy to feel like there's no pressure to get something done. But when you feel like I have to do something for next month. Yeah, I mean, like that's right. The, the deadline of I have to present and talk about. Joanna's done a fabulous job building that infrastructure for so many artists. Because like you said, when there's that gap between exhibiting, it can be what then. And it's really wonderful to have that social structure, but also that deadline. Yeah, so I thought really made a difference. It, it kept you feeling like I've got to do something else. And the other piece that's been nice is there are new members who come and go, but it, you know, it's a relatively small group, about 10, 11 people, but probably half of them have been uh, coming for the last five years or so. So that's nice. everyone's work change and they're seeing your work in change. So they understand each other's vocabulary um, has been lovely. Uh, and so that, that's really been helpful. And then when joining the gallery, another, some of whom are in the critique group, some of whom aren't, um, and we've got some new members recently who've been just terrific. Jill King uh, mm -hmm. joined She's the gallery. Wonderful. She's mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and we've had a photographer join, so it's really a mixed mm -hmm. group of, of people. Um, but again, the showings regularly, either individually or as groups. Um, has been nice that even if you don't sell, which of course we all hope to do, but you know that your work will be up. And I think yeah. for many of us, you know, that's such an important part. You don't want to have it just sitting in the, you know, in your studio at home. It is good for it to be seen. In fact, people listening can go and look at Space 900. It's at 816 Dempster. Right. Beautiful window display um, of your core members, and you all, you do a great job activating those windows in general. So any time of year, there's always good work to um, see just by walking by. That's between Sherman and what's the corner street? Um, I'm trying to remember now. Elmwood. Yeah. Elmwood. Yeah, right across from the copy room. Excellent. And then really quickly, who are your inspirations? Well, um, I, I would say um, in many different ways, um, Vera Clement really, even though her work is not the same as mine, but her use of texture and form and, and kind of guiding me way, way back um, was really an inspiration. Um, because I've been working with Joanna and color is an integral part of my work, mm -hmm. really an integral part of Joanna's work. Have you and Joanna exhibited side by side? We haven't, and, and um, we've done shows together. And I think um, the feeling sometimes has been it would be too much <laughs> to have all that color right next to each other. So kind of looking at each other's kind of piece. But mm -hmm. we have done works together. And um, I, I think because color to both of us is really such an integral um, part of us as artists. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my work can be, I think, too much for some people because it's it's pretty out there um old <laughs> colors um lots of dark there's not a lot of um soft impressionistic you know no it's, no but it's if, and if it's too much for them that's fine i just hearing the background and how you come to this work and how your daughter has a role in it it just it takes on a totally different life form when you're looking at the work. So I'm, I'm so glad that you got to share that with us today because it's, the work is wonderful and I'm so happy you're in the show. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Lisa. Um, you know, um, I don't want to get too schmaltzy, but you really made a difference in the Evanston art scene. You know? Oh, thank you. Um, having been here for a number of years and I think someone coming in and just saying, there's all these artists, there's all this great so work. So many of you. But, but we're all kind of disparate and we're not doing things together. We're not coordinating. So suddenly 
here's for Saturdays mm -hmm. together. Well, yeah. like you said, it's so fun. Like the group of Space 900, like getting a group of people to work together because visual art is so solitary. It's just so nice being able to like have a glue factor because there's so many people, there's so much going on. Absolutely, and such wonderful work. Yeah. And, you know, and your gallery has done a terrific job. Thank um, you. Uh, really, and, and Who knows? You know, no. real issues too, you know, mm -hmm. well, and you know, this is a time, you know, I even thought when I was doing these latest climate change things, well, they really, the, the focus was the colors and everything related to that, but it also felt like, boy, between the pandemic and racism, it's all kind of it's all in. on fire. Everything's on fire. The hope is this is going to lead to something better. Right. That we will rebuild and... You know, I, you're going to lead us into the new normal. That's what you artists are going to do. Don't think you're just going to keep painting. You're the people who are going to show us how to create, creatively problem solve our way out of it. I'm convinced. I, I really think so. And in lots of the arts. That, in lots know, of the arts, from uh, dance, writing, theater, all of it. Because culturally, you are the leaders who expose us to ourselves. And I just feel like good things are going to come out of this. I think so. I'm hanging up. I okay. have had it's such a, a pleasure. conversation with you. Thank you, Lisa. Take care.